Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How's it going today, Sofa Squad? Things are going good here. As you can see, it's a little bit froggy out. The humidity is back here. Oh my good. Y'all, I thought that we were officially in pumpkin spice latte season. Uh, I mean, I've been wearing my little hoodie, the whole nine yards, drinking the pumpkin spice lattes, living that PSL life. And I mean, they're like, we are going to have record breaker, record breaking temperatures for the weekend. And I'm just like, do you also mean soul crushing temperatures? So anyways, we're not here to talk about that or the Jurassic Park style mosquitoes that have come back with the heat. We're here to talk about the other tragedy, uh, the case against Amber Geiger. Uh, the victim in her case, Botham Jean, and the unfortunate set of incidents. We're in day three. That's what we're discussing in this video. I'm recording it on day four. But we're going to discuss that. There's a lot of more technical stuff, pictures, things of this nature. But there's also some very interesting things that came up in today's testimony. So without further ado, let's go ahead and review. So if you remember, they left off with Texas, the Texas Ranger up there uh, talking. And so basically they start back off with him again. They kind of review like his childhood, his education, how he came to be there. And then kind of the heart of the situation with him up there is they go into, they share lots of photographs of basically doing like comparisons of like, here's uh, floor three and four. Here's Amber's apartment. Here's his. And side note, she's not as mess as clean as everybody says. I mean, yeah, you know, Botham's apartment is definitely more like a bachelor pad. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, and that's probably the best word to describe it. You know, it's just a bachelor pad. But hers was, I would venture to say, I mean, in my opinion, a, just as much of a bachelor's pad. But that being said, yes, the apartments look exactly the same. So, I mean, there's that there. Does that excuse anything? Absolutely not. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. Now, he does go into saying, like, yeah, there's very little signs that show you where you're at. There's apparently, like, some placards on the elevators that say what floor it is, and that's about it. And he does say that since this event, they have changed that to show, you know, better representate what floor you're at, where you're at in the complex. Now, another thing that he brings up is the investigators, he says, like, we interviewed, I forget how many people, like 200 and some people about, you know, have you gone to the wrong floor? Like all these little surveys. And I'm going to read some statistics off here that he came up with. So 23% of the residents on floor three and four had put their key in the wrong door lock. 44% of the tenants on the third and fourth floor had walked to the wrong apartment. 32% of the residents on floor one through four had parked on the wrong floor of the parking garage. Here's my thing with these statistics and stuff like that. It shows that there is definitely an issue with this complex. They need to change that. It's dangerous. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, if this many people are having issues with their apartments, there's something going on here. Yeah, so again, I'll give that to them. Doesn't excuse anything that happened. Doesn't matter. There is still an innocent man dead. And there's many things that could have taken place. But just in general, like general safety guidelines for the rest of the people that don't go to the level of killing someone as soon as they walk into a room, you know, yeah, we probably need to have some better markers. Now, then they go into this whole thing about the strike plate in the door, which if you, you know, if you have a normal door or whatever, it's that plate that when you close the door, it's that little plate there. So he goes into like, they did this testing on it and he is confirming that there is like a structural flaw in that plate that prevented it from closing. And they did all these tests that basically depending on like how far it swung and how heavy and all this stuff, it would not close sometimes. So you can begin to see this picture through his evidence of what took place here. And he said that like what caused it was some over torque screws in the door and in the, in this, in this plate or whatever. So, I mean, there was a fault in there and I'm imagining that it was one of those things where if you didn't want the door to slam or whatever, it probably, you know, the door probably was ajar, not hanging open, but just didn't latch. And so she put it in and it opened or whatever. So they replayed the body cam footage again from the day before. 
And I mean, it's just, it's so hard to watch y'all. Oh my gosh. So this is like a whole thing that comes up then in this like little, one of their little private sessions, whatever, is, you know, can Armstrong just like give his opinion as to where Botham was when he was shot? And they were going to use like the shoes as part of his answer to that. But the judge is essentially like, no, you can't do that because that could have been moved by people, so on and so forth. So then he goes into like some of his training for like bullet trajectory and things of that nature. And he, it's his opinion that Botham Botham was standing about 13 feet, 13 to 15 feet uh, from the doorway. And he's basing this like on the bullet trajectory, uh, the blood pool on the floor, the location of the shoes, like where his earbuds were, the whole nine yards, and it, and again, where those shoes were. But it's just, you know, they couldn't decide just based on that if, you know, exactly where he was. I mean, I get that part or whatever, but anyway. Now he does say that, yeah, this is a different situation than responding to a burglary dispatch because she had to react immediately without time to like to think about it, you know, cover, concealment, planning, any of the stuff that they're supposed to do like on a call. Now he says it's his opinion that she didn't commit a crime. And honestly, yo, I was shocked over that. I'm not gonna lie. I was like, what? You know, because I was just like, you know, and I felt like his 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 evidence, whatever you call it, his testimony, you know, was very matter of fact. Like I did this, I did that. You know, he's not hiding anything. Yeah, the door is faulty. Yeah, this is that. Da 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 da. Um, but I just kind of believe that he was like, no, I don't think that she committed a crime. I was like, are you kidding me? You know, and I'm like, okay, again, I just come back to this where I'm like, I understand accidents happen. I do not personally think she sat out there and got off work and said, I'm going home to kill my upstairs neighbor. I do not think that took place. But again, I just come back to, I'm sorry, she is held to a higher standard. And in my opinion, even a higher standard than a regular police officer. And so if she, and I get it's a different situation, but I'm just like, my gosh, I mean, it's like she opened the door and just blasted. And then on top of it, you know, didn't do any of the stuff she's supposed to do. So, I mean, that's where I'm just like, I'm sorry. I feel like, you know, do I feel like, you know, again, does she commit a crime in the way of intentionally seeking out to kill this poor guy? No, I don't think that. But he's still dead. You know, and he goes further to say, you know, yeah, he thinks that she reasonably thought that she was in her apartment and there was a burglar there. He doesn't think that there is probable cause for a crime. And he doesn't think that there's reckless behavior or anything like that when she parked on the wrong floor. Now, basically what takes place is all that information is gonna be excluded from the jury because obviously it's like, like major objections over this. This would completely sway the jury. I mean, you have a Texas Ranger up here trying to say, he going against what the grand jury found basically is my how I look at it. You know, and I'm just like, well this, and basically also they're saying, this guy's not qualified as an expert this and the other and so you're sitting up here giving your opinion like well there's not even reason to be charge her with a crime and da, 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 da. And I mean I'm like yeah you can't unring that bell so you know it's just absolutely not so you know he gets up there that you know he is up there they finish up with his stuff and we get the next person up there and Christine Noble she works for the DA's office basically y'all I mean, we're talking her testimony. Basically, she was up there to talk about establishing timelines and time discrepancies. We're talking Split and Adams. We're talking high tech, Star Trek, Star Wars, Swatch watching. I mean, y'all. Uh, her stuff was way up here. Let's just leave it. She was up there. She was talking about the times that match up for the door locks, GPSs, NASA spaceships, I mean, you name it. And, you know, and they were down to like nanoseconds, you know, words that I don't even know. She was there to doubt, because remember, if you're watching this, there's like this, you know, oh, there's a two minute discrepancy. And so she was there to just confirm this is how he did this, and that's what that was about. And we can just move on along from her testimony. Now, the next set of witnesses, well, so there's going to be several more witnesses that were like neighbors. So the next one is Miss Jones. And she gets up there. She was a neighbor. She heard gunshots that night. Now, you know, she didn't hear anything beforehand. And this is one thing that's established with a lot of these people is they didn't hear, you know, show me your hands or something you might hear a police officer yell. Because I think what the state's looking for is, you know, a sense of did you give a warning shot? You know, did you, or not a warning shot, but like a, you know, what are you doing? Hands up, whatever. And there was none of that these people testified to. Now, you know, she also says, you know, she looked out the, the hallway or the peephole, the balcony, whatever. She saw Amber pacing. Uh, you know, she looked red, couldn't make out what she was saying. And essentially, that's really all her testimony was. Now, the defense gets up there and they kind of do the same type thing with the people of, okay, well, even if you heard a voice or whatever, you didn't know what they were saying. No, I didn't. 
and that kind of song and dance that they do. And, and the defense is also basically like, well, you said you were watching TV loud, so you actually could have missed hearing something. And yeah, so technically, yeah. And the next person is Whitney Hughes, and she was another neighbor. And she said she heard the shot, she knew they were gunshots, she didn't call the police because she saw Amber, and was like, oh, the cops are already here. You know, which I think that probably happened with several people, because I mean, of course you're gonna think that. You're not gonna think the cop just went and killed your neighbor. Uh, she too said she didn't hear any commands. Now she also said something to the effect of, yeah, if it was raining, you would have to do an extra step to make sure the doors closed fully. And it was essentially like if you're inside, pulling the doorknob, uh, or if you're outside, no, I'm sorry, vice versa. If you're inside pushing the door, if you're outside kind of pulling the doorknob to you to lock it or whatever. Uh, and so it does sound like kind of a humidity type situation like they were talking about. Uh, another witness, the next one that comes up is Miss uh, Miss Kinsey. She was FaceTiming with her boyfriend on the sofa when it happened. She heard some commotion. She heard a man and a woman's, woman's voices yelling, uh, running, slamming. Uh, she looked at the peephole. Uh, a, few, a little bit later, she hears a female call 911. Uh, she barely hears the words like some like shot and apartment 1478. She's getting little bits and pieces of their stuff. Uh, now the next witness is uh, Chanel Bly and she gets up there and this is the girl who had the big urn that we hear so much about that's like the marker like essentially one of the neighbors on the third floor of Amber and she testifies that she heard the gunshots too obviously she didn't hear as much it was a little bit more muffled because she's on a different floor but this is just giving context to this is the lady with the big urn that's the huge marker for everybody to know this is your floor and now the next person that gets up there is Dr. Castro uh, this is a trace evidence examiner from the da Dallas County Crime Lab she's up there to basically testify about the gunshot residue uh, evidence from the scene. Essentially what they use to do this is what they call GSR gunshot residue kits and the kits like were taken from inside and outside the door and one of them from his hand. Now she also said that the particles that they test for these are also found in like fireworks or airbags and vehicles and she also testified that yes these can be transferred by hand. Now one reason I think she was up there is to kind of give us a picture but also because they found some gunshot residue on his left hand or something like that and so to me a huge point of her stuff was to say no that was probably transferred by somebody else touching his hand but could also be trying to say well then that you know, and maybe Amber went down there and tried to help him or whatever. Maybe she did reach down and take his hand, you know, like, hey, bud, you know, whatever. Now, then the medical examiner, Dr. Gwen, gets up there, and this is very interesting. He goes into, you know, your typical, this is how we do autopsies. This is how we come up with manners and cause of death. Now, they show some pictures of uh, Botham to him so that they can identify him. They, the judge makes sure not to put it on the big screen or whatever, because can you imagine the family having to see that? Now, they talk about some of the stuff that the hospital did to Botham, like to treat him, like some incisions, some tubes, stuff like that. And he said that they typically leave the stuff on the victim when they come in. So they kind of clear that air of what, what's this and what's that. Now then he goes into the actual, like starts talking about the gunshot wound. And the injuries are, I'm gonna list them out here, a gunshot wound to the chest, entrance wound was on the left side just above the nipple. I, a bullet penetrated the chest and hit the interior aspect of the left fifth rib. The bullet hit the upper lobe of the left lung, heart, and went through the diaphragm. The bullet hit the stomach, hit the intestines twice, and came to rest in the muscle in the left abdominal cavity. Uh, there was damage to the heart, the bullet hit the left ventricle. Uh, that was sutured by the hospital when he got there, uh, but that is a significant wound to the body, they said. I mean, that's that's major. And then, I mean, to establish, you know, yeah, this would be very painful. Yeah, this would bleed very intensely. Now, the prosecutor takes his jacket off and lets the medical examiner, like, use his body to talk about the trajectory of this. And they use this little dowel rod to kind of, like, help us visualize the trajectory of this bullet. And so, I mean, just seeing them hold the rod up, you can tell, yeah, this guy was probably... You know, I mean, it's hard to explain to me, but like bent over or something, you know, probably in like, oh my gosh, you know, type situation. And so basically they're, they're sitting here saying, yeah, he was not standing. He looks to be bent over, so on and so forth. Now the defense gets up there and this is very touchy because the defense is going to try to peel apart what was said. And it's kind of like, you know, um, but they talk about how CPR would contribute to pushing blood out of the body. And he basically begins like questioning, like, what well, did you take specific measurements from the body of where the bullet was in there? And, you know, the medical examiner's like, no, I mean, the bodies are fluid. And he's like, oh, so things move around. And there's almost this insinuation of trying to say, you know, well, because you're saying the bullet went this way, you're trying to determine where he was standing or where he was at. But the bullet could have been moved or around by people, including the medical examiner and, you know, first aid 
educate people, all this type stuff. And he's essentially like, well, I mean, a little bit, but, you know, the evidence is the evidence. You know, it's not going to change that much from that. Now, the defense gets the dowel rod and essentially is like trying to do the same thing, but he's trying to show like on the sofa. He's using a chair to pretend he's on the sofa and showing the same thing. And it just kind of gets, you know, when somebody's reaching for something and it's kind of like, that's what this whole testimony of him, the, this is what the whole bit of the defense questioning him felt like, was the defense was just trying to reach, because again, you know, and like he said, you know, the trajectory is a trajectory. You know, so in my opinion, what they were trying to do is trying to show that, you know, she felt in danger, almost like he was coming at her or something like that. And, you know, basically saying like, oh, you know, people could still run after they get shot and da 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 And, you know, it all seems very pointless, honestly, because there's just, there's not much you can do with that testimony. I mean, it's basically science. And so then on redirect, the state gets back up there and they go into, well, isn't it true that you can have what they call purposeful steps after getting shot? You know, and they're basically like, well, yeah, totally depends on that individual you know yeah in the movies you see somebody getting shot and blown 10 feet backwards but that's the movies and this type gun doesn't do that so yeah he could have been shot and taken a couple more steps and then collapsed you know it, it i mean it is what it is so the last witness of the day is dr carr that's a crime scene analyst and she gets up there and basically you know she's just walking through what happened you know i got there i talked to the detectives i talked to my manager you know i got a plan for what i'm gonna do she photographed amber geiger like you know in the once they got her down there and that was very interesting because you know they're kind of showing her and pointing to stuff so these photographs of amber they show in the state side do you know what this is do you know what this is and they're pointing to basically her weapons the stuff on her belt she she still had her taser, she still had her um, sh mace, and then she still had her gun. So, and Alan Reese pointed out, she was just like, you know, I can't believe they didn't take her gun, and I'm surprised by that too. And also, what I thought when looking at it, is I was like, well, so she has other options. You know, there was other things she could have cra grabbed, non-lethal things, and she was going to go down that road of, you know, oh my god, shh, you know. It, there was other options before she got to, you know, lethal force. Now, Dr. Carr goes into all, I mean, there's tons of pictures with Dr. Carr. So, and she's testifying that, yeah, there was a TV that had been going and a laptop, but both facing towards the sofa, emitting light. So, you know, because this whole thing of, oh, it was dark, and it's like, I mean, I get it, it wasn't fully lit, but if she thought it was her apartment where there's lights right there, and, yeah, you know, there's lights going, so it's just bizarre that it's like, well, you didn't think to turn that on, or, you know, you didn't, I mean, you know, the light was on, you know, from the TV, it's a big TV, so it's just more that doesn't make sense. Now, another thing with Amber's stuff is that she said there was no visible injuries on Amber and no visible blood on her uniform. So, I mean, that, again, kind of confirms that yes, yeah, she wasn't down there helping him. Now, then they start going through this whole thing of like photograph by photograph of basically walking from the car to the crime scene. And it's tedious and it is what it is. And it's also, you know, just kind of sad to watch. So, and then they kind of end, she's going to be back in the stand this morning to do cross. And that should be interesting to see what, you know, what else they have to say with her. So that is it for today, y'all. Thank you for hanging out with me. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, we do have podcasts on Reese from Talks of Bliss and I. We do podcasts where we talk about this. We have audio and video versions. So be sure to check that out. Links are going to be down there. And you can always go to the website right here. And there's lots of stuff there. I try to update that on the regular. So that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the new people who are coming here. Thank you so much. And I'm glad to have you on the Sofa Squad. And we will talk to you soon.